Greetings! Many of you will be seeing this on the Sabbath. So for those of you who happen to see it on, on the Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom. It so happens that the Sabbath on which this is being recorded is Shabbat Shuvah. It's the Sabbath of repentance, the Sabbath of return. Because uh, mo uh, people who uh, keep the Sabbath would know that uh, w there is a covenant that God has made with his people that uh, God has certain expectations of us, commands that he has given us for our good. And obviously we need to return. If we've been lax in any way, we have to repent in the sense of return, return to that right path. And uh, these 10 days between the Festival of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, these 10 days of Teshuvah, 10 days of penitence, you could call them, this is a time for us to get back on track, and this Shab this Sabbath particularly, when we're not doing our normal work, would be a time to focus on that. I know there are some people uh, today, some uh, Christian communities that are in Washington, D.C., uh, having some kind of public uh, prayer uh, for God to uh, intervene in the affairs of the country. Uh, I want to go to... Uh, 1 John, the second chapter, and as we think about the concept of atonement, of the covering of our sins, uh, the uh, propitiation of our sins, uh, we can go to 1 John 2 in verse 2. My little children, John writes, I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. As you know, I have, in my dissertation at USC, I tried to put some kind of an academic label on, on the Church of God, and, and, and the label that I chose was Christian commandment keepers, having the faith of Jesus Christ and keeping the commandments of God. Romans, uh, Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12. Today in the synagogues, they'll be reading a couple of passages of uh, scriptures I'm going to quote. Uh, I want to first go to Hosea in the Minor Prophets. Hosea, the uh, 14th chapter. And I want to go to the, uh, I want to just begin here in the 14th chapter. O Israel, return to the eternal, your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. And now I want to go to the book of Micah. Uh, in the book of Micah, the seventh chapter, the Jews have a tradition during this time of year uh, to uh, go to a body of water and take crumbs of bread and throw them in the water uh, as if they're getting rid of their sins. <laughs> it would be nice if it would be that easy. Uh, in uh, Micah 7 and verse 18, Who is a God like you pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the, of the sea. Uh, in a way, this is the symb symbolism of baptism. It's not that, you know, the washing uh, it, it takes the sin away, but it's, it's symbolic. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's an outward sign of your repentance when you are baptized. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. And we understand that Christians, uh, part of the new, uh, who are those who are participating in the new covenant, spiritually speaking, become Abra Abrahamic. You know, if you look at Galatians, the third chapter, as one example. Today, I want to talk about our high priest and coming king. High priest and coming king. You know, when we talk about the Day of Atonement. There's, as I said, there's some interesting Jewish traditions, such as reading the verses I read to you, or the throwing of the breadcrumbs into the into a body of water. 
There's another interesting custom that you'll notice if you if you see Orthodox Jews on a Day of Atonement, uh, they may be dressed very formally to go to services, but of course this year is very difficult because of the COVID-19 situation. But on a, in a normal year, as you see large numbers of ultra-Orthodox Jews walking to synagogue, they're going to be walking because they don't uh, uh, have, uh, they don't drive on 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 on, on a uh, on a holy day, or certainly not on a weekly Sabbath, uh, but also not on a holy day. And so uh, as they're walking to synagogue, uh, you'll notice the, on the Day of Atonement specifically that they'll be dressed formally, but they'll be wearing tennis shoes or sneakers. They won't be wearing leather shoes. And this isn't because it says in the Bible that on the Day of Atonement you have to afflict your souls. No, that's not the point. Uh, they, they have decided that besides afflicting your souls, as it says in the Bible, to afflict your souls on the Day of Atonement, which is a fast. Look at Isaiah 58. Look at uh, Psalm 35, 13 in the original Hebrew. You know, it's, 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 it's clear. And then, of course, look at Acts uh, 27 and verse 9. You know, so we understand the Day of Atonement is a time of, of fasting, but they have decided also... Uh, in rabbinic tradition, there are other things that they should not do on, this, on, on the Day of Atonement. Uh, the, no, uh, no anointing, no bathing, no sexual relations, and no leather, sho no leather shoes. That's just something that uh, the rabbis have decided ought to also be a part of the, uh, of the Day of Atonement. Speaking about ultra-Orthodox Jews, there was a, an ultra-Orthodox Jew who went to his rabbi and said, I have to... Uh, I have to confess something. I, I I felt like I ought to tell you about it. I uh, I had a formal meal with bread, and didn't wash my hands uh, beforehand. And and the rabbi said, "Well, you know, you're supposed to have the ritual washing before you eat bread uh, with a meal. So um, you know, I'm sorry that you uh, that you didn't that you didn't do that. But I appreciate you telling me. Uh, what would how, how did that happen?" Uh, so he said, well, uh, it, to, to tell you the truth, it was in, in, in an unkosher restaurant. What? An unkosher restaurant? What were you doing there? Well, all, uh, all the kosher restaurants were closed. Why were all the kosher restaurants closed? It was Day of Atonement. You know, he got deeper and deeper and deeper, you know. So the Yom HaKippurim, though, is coming up, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, uh, in uh, an American language, Yom Kippur. It's coming up, the Day of Atonement. And this is the Sabbath before the Day of Atonement. And on the Sabbath, I wanted to talk about our high priest and coming king. It struck me this year as I was looking at Leviticus 16 and the rituals uh, involving the high priest to focus on the fact that we have a living high priest that Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for us, yes, but was resurrected, it is immortal, and so we have a living high priest, as I just read to you, uh, as our advocate, as one who intercedes for us in that sense. And I want to go to Revelation 20. When you, go, when you see the rituals in Leviticus 16, you see what they are picturing. Uh, in, in Revelation 20, we see that you know, the, the uh, Azazel goat, the scapegoat that is sent away. The, the sins of the people are confessed upon the goat by the high priest. And then the goat is sent away into the wilderness. The, uh, a, a fit person, a suitable person is chosen to take the goat away. And in Revelation 20, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So this begins the millennium. And he cast him, or at least it's early in the millennium, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Fortunately, just a little while. And then that's the end of his career after that. The end of any in influence that Satan will have over anything or anyone. So the ceremonies, the rituals of the Day of Atonement, 
uh, do picture that, as you see in Revelation 20. Now, if you go back to biblical times, uh, you will find that when you read about the about Yom Kippur, about the Day of Atonement, uh, in biblical times, and at the time of at the time of, of Jesus Christ, the, the high priest was a very critically important figure. If you read Leviticus 16 and the rituals connected with the Day of Atonement, the high priest was a ver was was really the hero of the day. And uh, the Jews were very concerned that the high priest need to be needed needed to be a, a person of character who could walk into the Holy of Holies. The high priest only could go into the Holy of Holies and only once a year. And when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, that was the only time uh, in the time of Jesus Christ when uh, Jews would pronounce God's personal name, which is spelled yud Hey vav Hey. And uh, quite frankly, some ultra-Orthodox Jews to this day are so careful not to pronounce the name, they won't even spell it. They'll say to you, yud K vav K. They won't even spell it, let alone say it. But uh, in the time of Christ, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would say the Tetragrammaton, the, the, uh, what was probably pronounced Yahweh, he would say it. And uh, the, the Jews would have a, tra have a tradition of tying a rope around his waist when he went in there. And uh, because they thought he might, not, he might not come out alive. If he were not vir virtuous, if he were not uh, appropriately the high priest, then they they they, fig they uh, uh, figured he would die in there, and they would have to drag him out. So it was a very solemn occasion. Now, when the high priest did all the rituals correctly, when he did what he had to do and came out alive, that was oh, just such a wonderful time. Such a sense of relief came over the people. It was just thrilling. It would have been very interesting to have been in Jerusalem at that time when the high priest came out of the Holy of Holies, came out alive to see the, you know, just the, the change in mood from real, you know, from, from terror to, to joy. It would be very interesting to, for a person to, uh, to notice that. Uh, and, um, I'd like to, uh, go to the, uh, Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Well, first let me go to Malachi, Malachi, the second chapter. Uh, before I, as I turn there, I want to say something to help illustrate uh, the role of the high priest at that time. Let's say that two people are married and they're having trouble uh, in the marriage. In this case, the wife has really been, let's say, uh, ah, has fallen far short, all right? And uh, now they go to a marriage counselor to reconcile uh, the, the wife with the husband. And the marriage counselor is able to to do what is necessary, so the two of them are able to. So the husband is able to say, "Okay, you know, I'm I'm fine with it. We're going to continue with the marriage." Uh, so everything works out fine, but there has been an intercession uh, by by a third party, uh, and that's in effect what the high priest is doing on the Day of Atonement. From year to year, the con the community came together as a community, knowing that as as a community. It, it had fallen short. So the high priest performed these rituals to get the community back reconciled because it was like a husband-wife relationship with God. It was a covenant. It was a marriage, as you read in the Bible, the analogy of a marriage. So the wife had, had, had not been a good wife, but now the, the uh, high priest, as the third party, does what's necessary so the husband says okay we're going to continue with this relationship so that's maybe kind of an idea of the role of the high priest and you see how he was a type of Jesus Christ how Jesus Christ is our high priest whatever what Jesus Christ did and does enables us to have a right relationship with God it helps us to it, it enables us to be justified uh, before God because he took all the penalties upon himself that we have incurred, including death itself. Uh, but now he's resurrected and he's our living Savior. And that's something that was impressed, impressed upon me as I read Leviticus 16, that we have a the high priest came out alive, everybody was excited, and we have a living high priest today, Jesus Christ. And of course, he's far greater. 
he's far greater than than the the ironic priest. Uh, I want to go to Mal and I say that as an ironic priest, you know, and I realize that you know the ironic priesthood is <laughs> nothing compared to the priesthood of Jesus Christ, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, the Melchizedek priesthood. The ironic priesthood did, did have a role to play, and will have a role to play, but not nothing in comparison to the role of Jesus Christ. And in uh, Malachi 2 and verse 4, he, uh, talking to the uh, Levites, uh, J uh, God says through Malachi, uh, then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Eternal of Hosts. And um, so he, he uh, speaks about the covenant of Levi. And you'll see, um, let's go to verse 8. But you have departed from the... Well, I, I, let me go and, verse, and, and look at this, the uh, sixth verse. Um, well, I'll keep, just keep reading. I'll read the fifth verse. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. That is the proper role of the, Le of the Levites, you know, the ministry of that day. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge. He's talking now particularly about the Aaronic branch of the Levites, the, Ko the Kohanim, the priests. And people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the eternal of hosts. This is a play, of course, on, on Malachi's name. Malachi means my messenger, or it could be short for Malachiah, messenger of the eternal. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the eternal of hosts. So, unfortunately, they had not, they had not lived up to their their com their commission, uh, but there was a covenant with Levi. Now, if you go to uh, Numbers eighteen, I want to go to Numbers eighteen and and verse nineteen. You see that among the Levites there was one branch that were supposed to be the priests, uh, and uh, in verse Numbers eighteen nineteen. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the eternal I have given to you. He's talking to Aaron and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of Saul forever before the eternal with you and your descendants with you. And you can, look, by the way, look at Jeremiah 33 and uh, more I said about that, but I won't turn to that today. It talks about the covenant with the priests and Levites, it talks about the covenant with Aaron, with uh, David, the Davidic covenant. Uh, and of course, Jesus Christ uh, ha was a descendant of David, as the prophecy indicated he, he should be. Um, I want to go now to the 25th chapter of, uh, of uh, Numbers, 25th chapter of Numbers. And... Um, we're going to hear uh, read about Phineas, who was a descendant of Aaron, a grandson. Uh, this is twenty five eleven, and he acted boldly to protect uh, the, the spiritual well being of his people. So Phineas, verse eleven, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. And so there is a covenant with Phineas. And so the uh, uh, when we come to the millennium, the uh, descendants of Aaron uh, and Levi will be there in the temple, uh, in Jerusalem, that, that Jerusalem temple that will exist in the millennium, but the only ones who will be priests will be that branch of Aaron that descend from Phineas. The, the Phineas branch will be the, uh, the priests at that time. The other descendants of Aaron will be with the other Levites assisting the descendants of Phineas. So there still will be a priesthood, but that priesthood has its role to play, as I said, but the ultimate high priest 
and the high priest who really gets the job done for us, spiritually speaking, the, the critical personality in our salvation, in God's plan of salvation, is Jesus Christ. He is high priest and coming king. He combines the role of priest and king. Uh, he's not a Levite. He's a member of, he's a part of the tribe of Judah, a descendant of David, but he is also a priest. How, how is that possible? Uh, well, we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. Uh, I want to go to the fourth chapter of Hebrews, though. Sorry, the fifth chapter. And just, it talks about the greatness of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ that we can think about as we come to the Day of Atonement, as perhaps we review Leviticus 16 and the rituals that took place. If we go to uh, Hebrews, the fifth chapter, it speaks here about Jesus Christ as our high priest, our intercessor. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So besides the priesthood, there was the high priest, and he was the one who performed those essential rituals on the Day of Atonement. He can have compassion, com compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. You know, he's a human being also, he understands. Because of this is required as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who was called by God just as Aaron was. So, you know, I can't just decide. I want to I wanna be the high priest. You know, the high priest is selected. And the first one was divinely appointed Aaron, and then uh, the high priest was selected from within the priesthood, uh, from that point. Now, the question is, how is it that Jesus Christ is our high priest when we know that he is Davidic? He, he is from the royal tribe, not the priestly tribe, as it says in Hebrews 7, 14. Let's, in, my, in my Bible, I can just go over, one page over to the 14th uh, verse of, seven, of uh, Hebrews 7. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So let's go back to the book of Genesis. And here it is probably spring of the year. That's the best time for warfare in the Middle East. Uh, so let's say they're going to war in the spring. And uh, this war concludes successfully... Uh, and uh, at least from the point of view that uh, Abram, Abram, uh, who later his name changed to Abraham, uh, he was able to uh, save Lot and, and the others, his nephew Lot and the others, as well as what was uh, pillaged. And he came back with uh, a lot of booty as well as his nephew and so on. And so I go to verse um, 17. Uh, of Genesis 14. Well, let's go to verse 18. Then Melchizedek. Oh, that's interesting. Here's somebody called Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And he's also called here king of Salem. Uh, so he's the king of peace. This is probably the city that we call Jerusalem. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. So here it's uh, spring of the year. And he brings out bread and wine. So this is, in effect, a, a pre-Passover. He brings out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Of all. So here he's here is a, a, a priest, but not... You know, not uh, an Ab uh, 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 not a, re a relative of Abraham, evidently, or at least we don't know what his background is. We, you know, as 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 the Book of Hebrews tells us, <laughs> we don't have a genealogy form, we don't have a birth form, we don't have a death form. He just appears. So here is this uh, righteous king, uh, who 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 serves the Most High God in an age when of polytheism. He serves the Most High God, and Abraham tithes to him. So this Melchizedek becomes a type 
uh, uh, of Jesus Christ. His priesthood is not based on genealogy. It's evidently based upon the, his righteousness, and God used him as a priest at that time. He had a ministry at that time, and his ministry came before uh, the designation of the Levites and the Aaronites and the descendants of Phineas. It came before that, long before that. So this, it is the Melchizedek priesthood, in a sense, that is preserved through Jesus Christ. And his priesthood supersedes the priesthood of the, of, 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 of the Kohanim. And we go to uh, Psalm uh, 110, uh, the beginning of which was a uh, stumbling block to this theological scholars of Jesus' day before his arrest, uh, you know, when he entered Jerusalem for the last uh, time before his arrest, uh, he challenged them with that, uh, with the beginning of that psalm, and they couldn't give him a good answer for what it meant. So let's go to Psalm uh, 110. So a psalm of David. So Yahweh, Adonai, the Eternal, Hashem. The Lord said to my Lord, to Adonai, to my Lord, Okay, now wait a minute. So God said something to David's Lord. So who's David's Lord? Well, he's the descendant of David. He's the Messiah. So, But he's also David's Lord because he's Davidic and he's divine. And so because he's Davidic and divine, because he's, he's human and divine, God can speak to him, can speak to the human. And uh, he resurrected the human to immortality. The first human being raised to immortality. Uh, a psalm of David, the eternal said to my lords, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, let's jump down to uh, verse 4. The eternal has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Oh, so he is a Melchizedek type of priest. He is perfect, sinless. So he, does, he doesn't have the genealogy of a priest, but he, he, he is in the in the tradition of Melchizedek. He's a priest by virtue of virtue. And he is our high priest. And as I said, he died for us, but he was resurrected and he lives for us. He guides and directs us. And through God's spirit, he lives in us. So we have a high priest who died for us, but who now is a living high priest. It's, it's so exciting to think about that. And he's coming back. And uh, when he comes back, our, our uh, destiny will be fulfilled. He will come back and we will be resurrected and rule under him as kings and priests in his kingdom. I want to go to Romans 5 and uh, verse 10. For if when we, Romans 5, 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So yes, we are saved, we are, we are justified, reconciled to God by, by the death of Jesus Christ. We are saved by his life. He is coming back. He's our high priest and also our coming king. He unites uh, priest uh, and king. And uh, what I said... Uh, a lot of that instruction you can find in Hebrews 7 if you go through it. I didn't. I, uh, I meant to uh, quote a lot of Hebrews 7 today, but in effect, I'm uh, I'm giving it to you in, in a kind of paraphrase form. I'd like to go now, though, to Hebrews uh, the fourth chapter. So, my point today is to is to emphasize the role of Jesus Christ in God's plan of salvation. Which, which we can think about on the Day of Atonement as we review the, uh, the, the meaning of the day and the rituals of the day that were performed uh, under the Old Covenant. Uh, we can remember, uh, first of all, we need to know the reality of, of evil and the reality of the evil one. There is a Satan. There are demons. They need to be gotten out of the way, ultimately. God will take them out of the way, ultimately. And ultimately, they will have no... Of, uh, no effect on eternity. They will be uh, eternally of no of no impact. Right now, however, they have a tremendous influence on the world, which we need to overcome through the Holy Spirit. Ruach Hakodesh, Tonef We have to have. We need God's Spirit to overcome that kind of influence. 
And so the Day of Atonement reminds us of that. It also reminds us of Jesus Christ as our high priest, but also as our coming king, who will, who will direct the performance of what I read to you in Revelation 20. I want to go to Hebrews 4 and uh, verse uh, 14. Hebrews 4:14, 4, seeing that we have a, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We can, we can be encouraged and inspired by God's plan of salvation, which we remember as we keep these various holy days, appointed times as they come around. And I'm speaking between two of them between the Festival of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. I'm speaking on the Sabbath in between. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He came and, and lived as a human being. He went through everything a human being goes through. He became a fertilized egg in the womb of Mary. And then all the way through, you know, uh, he lived a, a human life. And then he suffered beyond uh, imagination and then finally died. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was sinless. And then... He was resurrected. That is the one sign he left uh, human beings to know who he it was and who he is. You know, as he said in Matthew 12, you know, the uh, I, maybe I should turn there uh, just to, to read the actual verse, uh, verses. Uh, let's go to Matthew 12. Um, I'll read 39 and 40 of Matthew 12. Then he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. But no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And by the way, uh, the book of Jonah is what uh, Jews traditionally read on the Day of Atonement. Verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But then, you know, that's the end of the story. He comes up then to life, to immortal life. And he is at the right hand of the Father. So in verse 16, we need to be praying and praying in his name and praying with confidence in his name. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So all of us, uh, as we approach the next stage of this festival season, as we approach the, the uh, fast of the Day of Atonement, as we approach the feasting of the Festival of Tabernacles and the Eighth Day of Sacred Assembly, let's focus on the hero of the Holy Days. Let's focus on the personality of Jesus Christ that he may his personality and character would be reflected in, in each and every one of us. Let us be diligent in prayer, praying in Jesus' name. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus Christ is our high priest and coming king. All the best to you and yours.